And as I've prepared, I've been praying that God would create in our church more and more a culture of encouragement. But most of all, I prayed that he would begin with me. Well, as we stand together, let me pray for us. Father God, thank you for your word, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand it, and that as you speak to us, that you'd help us to trust what you say. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take a seat. Now, we're right in the middle of a teaching series called Church Life, How to Love One Another. Each week, we've looked at a different aspect of our life together and learned from the many one another phrases in the Bible, what Christian community looks like. And tonight we come to encourage one another. Now according to the dictionary, to encourage someone means something like persuading them to do or continue to do something by what you say and do. We use the word encourage in loads of different ways and often it means something that you might say that makes another person feel good about themselves. Uh, my son Josh loves encouragement. Last year he was taking part in the mini Great North Run. It was my duty to run alongside him and make sure he was safe. It's a very short run. It takes place on the Saturday before the Great North Run. It's nothing as long as that, don't worry. Very short, about a kilometre, I think. But what Josh loved most about the race were the crowds who'd lined up on the route, cheering him and encouraging him along, or so he thought. I think he thought they'd all turned up for him. And in fact, he got so excited by all these people cheering him on and encouraging him that he completely forgot about the race and he just kept running backwards and forwards between the two sides, high-fiving everybody <laughs> along the way. And I had to keep encouraging him and reminding him uh, that he needed to run the race. But when the word encouragement appears in the Bible, it has a more specific Christian use. Encouragement in the Bible isn't focused on complimenting someone's haircut or telling them how good their homemade lasagna tastes. And one of the places where the phrase encourage one another appears in the Bible is in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. So please turn with me to Hebrews 10. It was read earlier, and we'll see from there what Christian encouragement looks like. If you found your way to Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to read from verse 24. Hebrews 10, verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews wants to encourage us, and he wants us to encourage one another, and he tells us to do that. And so in these verses, we have a command to obey. But the whole reason the letter was written in the first place was to encourage those who received the letter to keep going. And so as well as a command to encourage one another, we have in the passage that we're looking at a wonderful model of exactly what that encouragement looks like. And from it, we can learn how to do what we are commanded to do. Earlier in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, we read these words. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Hebrews 4:14 4, is a great summary verse for the book. The writer is encouraging his readers, who are already believers, to hold fast to the gospel that they had come to believe in and to continue living by faith in Jesus. How does he do that in the book? By reminding them of the wonderful message of the gospel, by reminding them of who Jesus is, as we see in this verse, that he is the Son of God, and by reminding them of what he has done for us as our great high priest. And that basically is what encouraging one another is about. It's about helping one another to keep going as Christians by speaking God's words to each other. And that leaves us with an obvious question. What is it that would keep us Sorry, what is it that would stop us keeping going as Christians? 
Our passage tonight suggests three main dangers. They're not the only ones, but they are significant issues, and we'll all face them sooner or later. Here they are. First, the issue of what happens when we do something wrong. In other words, when we go against what we know God has said. Secondly, what do we do when something goes wrong? When we face suffering, whether that's personal or the suffering of those around us. And thirdly, when we are on our own and feeling weak. That's a really tough situation. So what do we do when we do something wrong, when something goes wrong to us and when we're on our own and feeling weak? So have a think. Who do you know right now who's facing one of those issues, one of those dangers right now? Perhaps it's someone in your small group. Perhaps it's a Christian friend who's working or studying away. But before we move on, make sure you have at least one person in mind. What are they facing? And now let's look back at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25, and see what that has to teach us. And just so you know where we're heading, here's my outline. We'll see that Jesus has done everything needed for us to have a relationship with God. That's from verses 19 to 21. And so when you sin, draw near to God. When you suffer, hold on to the hope of heaven. And when you feel weak, help each other to keep believing. So firstly, Jesus has done everything needed for us to have a relationship with God. That's from verses 19 to 21. Look at verse 19 with me. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, in our relationship with God, we can have confidence to enter the most holy place. What does that mean? Well, the most holy place was a part of the Jewish temple, and it represented God's presence. One high priest could enter that space just once a year. But they were so uncertain that he would survive a face-to-face meeting with a holy God that they tied a rope around him so they could pull him out if he had happened to die in there. That most holy space represented access to God himself. And these verses remind us that there is a way by which we can have confidence to enter the very presence of God who created the whole universe. We can come to him without worrying about whether or not he will accept us when we approach. And that includes when we pray to him now, as well as when we will meet him after we die. We can enter with confidence. When I first asked my wife to go out with me, you could say that I was pretty confident. It was basically because it had never occurred to me she might say no. And by the way, she did, the first time at least. I was also pretty confident when I asked her to marry me, so much so that I booked a table in a nice restaurant to celebrate our engagement weeks before the evening I had put aside to ask her to marry me. I should have learnt my lesson. She said no again and the next time, and the time after that. Now, in those situations, I approached her with confidence, but it was actually confidence in myself. You might suggest a better name for that is arrogance, which it was. Now, the writer of Hebrews doesn't mean that kind of confidence. He doesn't mean arrogance. We can approach God not because of who we are or what we have done, but rather... Look again at verse 19. We can approach God by the blood of Jesus. We can stand before God because Jesus, by his wonderful death on the cross for us, has made it possible for us to be clean from our sin. That's what we'll remember later on tonight as we take part in our communion service together. And there's no way on earth that we should have any confidence whatsoever to even peek at God from a distance, let alone boldly walk up to him and call him our father. The Bible is so clear, we've all turned away from him and rejected him as our Lord, and we deserve nothing but his anger and judgment. But as it says in Hebrews 7, verse 27, Jesus sacrificed for our sins once for all when he offered himself in our place. But let's read on in chapter 10, verse 20. By the new 
and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Again, this picks up the imagery of that Old Testament temple. In front of that most holy place was a curtain that divided it from the holy place. And the curtain was like a massive no-entry sign between us and God. We couldn't see or enter his presence, but that curtain was eventually ripped in half. When Jesus died for us on the cross, Mark tells us in chapter 15, verse 38 of his gospel, that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. A new way has been opened for us to come before God. And verse 21 continues, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, not only has Jesus achieved all of that for us, he continues to be our priest. Not only are we accepted in him, we're also helped by him. And if we are Christians, we're now part of that house of God. We belong to him. That is who we are. That is our identity. And as you look through them, verses 19 and 21 say loud and clear, Jesus' death has done everything we need to have a relationship with God. And the way we become a Christian is the way we grow as a Christian. And so this is the truth that will help keep us going as Christians. And encouraging one another simply means speaking those truths into one another's situation, lovingly and kindly and repetitively. Encouraging each other means helping each other to remember who Jesus is and what he has done for us so that we can keep going as Christians. And so what do those truths mean when we sin? What do they mean when we suffer? What do they mean when we feel weak? And we'll, we'll now look at each one of those briefly in turn. And so firstly, when you sin, draw near to God. That's from verse 22. Now, of course, all Christians will sin. That's a fact of life. But it doesn't make it any less serious. Sin is serious, and it affects not just us, but those around us. And it is very easy to let that cause us to give up. We begin to doubt that we can be forgiven. We begin to feel that the curtain has been hung back up, that that no entry sign to God's presence is back again. That's not true. We have been forgiven if we trust in the blood of Christ. It's incredible, but when we trust in Jesus, God doesn't just tolerate us. We're welcomed in by him and forgiven by him. We're accepted and belong to him. So what should we do? Verse 22 again. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. To draw near with God includes prayer, but it's more than that. It means to draw towards him relationally, even though we may have a guilty conscience because of the wrong that we've done. We can still, even when we've sinned, approach him with confidence and ask to be cleansed and washed by what Jesus has done. It's not an automatic process. We need to ask for forgiveness, accepting that, we have done, that what we have done is wrong and trusting in Jesus for that forgiveness. But this is the point when Satan, who is very, very real, loves it when we sin because he has an opportunity to try and convince us that we are too bad for God that we've blown it just that once too many, that there's no point trying to ask for forgiveness again. He's happy if we recognise our sin, as long as we do nothing about it. So what are we to do? Well, we need to remember that Jesus' death has done everything needed for us to have a relationship with God. And as verse 22 encourages us, we are to draw near to God. But crucially, we need to help those we know who have sinned to do that too. Sin is serious, but we need to deal with it by asking for, God's, asking for God's forgiveness, rather than allowing that sin to cause us to drift away from him. Growth in maturity as a believer is measured not by feeling that you're sinning less, but marked by how quickly you turn back to God after your sin and ask him for forgiveness. Sin can cause us to give up, and it can cause us to turn away from Jesus. Don't let it. When you sin, draw near to God. And when we see one another in that position, we need to encourage each other 
to do just that, to draw near to God. Well, secondly, when we suffer, we are to hold on to the hope of heaven. That's from verse 23. I'm sure you don't need me to remind you, but all Christians will face suffering. Many wrongly teach that God promises that if we are Christians, that we'll only receive material blessings. The Bible makes no such promises. Whereas, in fact, it promises that if we believe in him, that we will face suffering, both in general, because of living in a world messed up by sin, and specific suffering for being a Christian. And in a group this size, some of us will be going through a tough time even now. And even if you're not, for sure you will suffer at some point in your life. Perhaps an illness, a broken relationship, unemployment, tragedy. Life can be unbelievably tough at times. And I've seen God as a church use us to help people from all over the world come to know the Lord Jesus. It's amazing seeing people put their faith in Jesus and all the way that that has impacted their lives. But I've also seen the way that trusting in Jesus has often brought with it suffering. For example, I remember a young man from Pakistan who was baptised just here at the front of church who came to faith in Jesus and then his parents completely cut him off. And the danger is that we allow suffering to cause us to give up. We begin to doubt that God is good or we doubt that God's really in control. I know how it is to feel both those things in the face of suffering. But what are we to do? Look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. What do we do? We remember that Jesus' death has done everything for us to have a relationship with God, and we hold on to the hope of heaven. And we can know that we are headed to heaven. We can be 100% sure of that. Not because we're good enough. It doesn't depend on us. We know that Jesus has done all that is needed. We belong to him. And we know that when we die, we will receive what he has promised. We may face pain or difficulties now, but we're not to give up. We have a certain hope in heaven. And that should put everything else into perspective. Our life here is just like time spent in an airport lounge. We're in transit. This is neither our home nor our ultimate destination. And suffering is real. But we need to deal with it by remembering that he is faithful. And we know that because of what he has done for us in Christ. And again, we need to encourage one another to hold on to those truths that the God who loves us so much sent his son to die for us. We need to remind one another at those times of suffering that he is a good God. Suffering can cause us to drift away from him. Don't let it. When you suffer, when you see others suffering, hold on to the hope of heaven. And let's encourage one another to do that too. And finally, number three, when you feel weak, help each other to keep believing. Some verses 24 and 25. The final thing that can cause us to st- that can cause us to stop keeping going as Christians is simply isolation. We're not designed to be on our own, and there is a real danger that when that happens, we feel isolated or lonely. Perhaps we're the only Christians in our flat or house, the only Christian in our family or in our workplace, and that can be tough. No matter how strong you feel now, when we're all together, being on your own will make you feel weak. And the danger is that you're tempted to throw away your confidence in Jesus. So what should you do? Look at verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, it's pretty obvious that we need to keep meeting together, so make meetings like this a priority. Put them in your diary, plan round them. If you're not in a small group, then join up. Make meeting up with other Christian believers to read and apply God's word a priority in your life. 
But it's not just meeting together that we need. It's meeting in such a way that we can help one another to keep coming back to that gospel so that we keep going as Christians. Which is why God's word needs to be at the heart of our time together. That doesn't mean every single time we meet, we'll open God's word. But surely it means that whatever we say, whatever we do, we're never far away from speaking the truth of God's word to one another. And it's in that context that the command to encourage one another appears. This is not written to ministers or those with official badges and roles. This is something for all of us to do. And it's true for all of us that we often approach meeting with other Christians in a totally me-centered way. We see church as basically an individual activity, a bit like a petrol station. I'll pop along, have a refill. We say to ourselves, I could do with some good teaching tonight, or I could do with a good time of worship. And we get what we need, and then we head back to our life and world. But we need each other, and so we need desperately to change our perspectives. When we meet together, whether that's large or small groups, we need to think of everyone else. What do they need? How can I encourage those who may be struggling with sin, or facing suffering, or feeling isolated? We also need to make a habit of looking around and noticing who's not here so we can get in touch and see that they're okay. And then we need to remember that what matters most is put, what matters most, and the way to do that is to remember that the day is drawing near, as this verse puts it, that Jesus is coming again soon to judge the living and the dead. We need to keep going as Christians and we need to help as many others as possible to be ready for his return. Isolation can cause us to drift away from Jesus. Don't let it. When you feel weak, look for help to keep believing. And look for opportunities to help other believers to keep believing too. So that's Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. We've seen that Jesus has done everything needed for us to have a relationship with God. So when you sin, draw near to God. When you suffer, hold on to the hope of heaven. When you feel weak, help each other to keep going. We need to encourage one another and all the more as we see the the day drawing near. So when you see others struggling with sin, encourage them to draw near to God. When you see others suffering, encourage them to hold on to the hope of heaven. When you see others feeling weak, help them to keep believing. This is something for all of us. So will you pray that God will show you an opportunity to encourage someone tonight, each day? Who can you send an encouraging note or email or text or phone call? Perhaps that person who came to mind earlier on. I find that when I'm regularly praying for members of my small group, for example, who are mission partners, that the Lord often helps remind me to get in touch and to encourage them. Remember that encouragement also can take many different forms. Some formal, some informal. It can happen in the car as we talk with our children, after a service as we chat with someone about the content of the sermon, over our back fence as we talk with a neighbour about the gospel, in a one-to-one meeting with a friend, or in that note that you're sending someone who's going through a hard time. And as I've prepared, I've been praying that God would create in our church more and more a culture of encouragement. But most of all, I prayed that he would begin with me. Let's pray. Well, thank you so much for that gospel. Thank you that Jesus died and that it is now possible to approach your throne with confidence. Father, help us not to throw away our confidence. Help us not to be distracted by sin or suffering help us not to turn away from your people and father help us to encourage one another to hold firm and to hold on to the truth in jesus name amen